you know, as we are proceeding now to the next speaker, uh, Eduardo Canales. Um, Eduardo, are you with us in the room? Dr. Sada, if you could just help me check if uh, Eduardo Canales is with us in the room. Yes, not, I would is he here with us? Very good. Can you hear me? Eddie, you need to unmute your mic. Uh, my mic is unmuted, but Eduardo's mic, can you hear? No, Eddie is not unmuting. Eddie's not unmuting. Uh, maybe somebody from the technical side can assist us to see. Uh, it could be that he has to be made co-host. We are trying, but uh, I'm giving him notification, but he's not accepting. You are getting notification. Okay. So, uh, Filippo, are you with us? We could quickly get to Filippo while we deal with the technical issues to get um, uh, Mr. Canales to join us. Uh, so, I will go ahead and then introduce Filippo Furi. Filippo, I think you're with us. Uh, yep, I am. Super. Um, and um, so Filippo Fury is uh, a PhD candidate in anthropology uh, from the University of Montreal, and his research focuses on migration, uh, local hospitality, and the notion of asylum and a sanctuary city. Uh, he's an associate uh, researcher in the MECMI uh, project, which is a project that looks at death in the migration context. Um, and this project is run by um, uh, Yukuam uh, University, as well as uh, the Paris uh, Nanterre. Uh, and it's a project there that looks at sort of as at mapping migrants barriers in the city of Cantania. Um, and I think we will hear some, uh, some insights from this project. I, I also uh, think that, uh, you know, uh, Filippo Furi is, is, not, uh, is, not, is a name that's um, very well known for, for several years in terms of following uh, the plight of migrants in cities uh, around the world, not just uh, in Italy, for instance, uh, some, some gripping stories there where he had done a, a looking at migrants' plights in, in Europe, but also particularly also looking at Venice. He is a member of the international network called Migre Europe. Uh, and is engaged in the Boats for People Collision, which works to defend the rights of migrants at sea. Um, and he has been working on these uh, stories and covering these stories and going a bit in depth, starting from 2003, where he started focusing on dead and missing persons uh, to produce information guides, particularly to support families uh, and their supporters. Uh, and these guides are available in, in multiple languages. And I hope we can hear a little bit about this. He is also um, working, uh, he's also yeah, an expert. I am here. For the... Oh, I am okay. Here. Eduardo, is that okay if I can if I can uh, if I can have you uh, give us your reflections just after Filippo? So that will be in the next couple of minutes. Yes, yes. I'm sorry uh, we got uh, disconnected there, but I'm I'm back. Um, yes, so, uh, the South Texas <clears throat> the South Texas Human Rights Center was <clears throat> was founded in 2013, and uh, the one of the main reasons uh, the principal reasons is that they're, they're in South Texas, and we're talking about the U.S.-Mexico border, there was no um, established protocols regarding, um, in, you know, identifying or in, uh, in, encountering the unidentified migrant bodies in, in South Texas. So when we, um, when we be, uh, uh, started the center in, in South Texas, we were, um, uh, one of the main issues was that they were not taking DNA um, uh, in um, uh, uh, before they were burying the individuals, and and this was very very critical uh, protocol, you know, in different counties because each county has their own uh, in in South Texas has their own protocols, and do, they do not have um, uh, medical examiners' offices in every county. Uh, they depend on a justice of the peace to go out and basically the justice of the peace just goes out and rules um, uh, the time of death and says that the person is um, had, uh, was deceased because of the elements. So in 2013, no, uh, in Brooks County, which was um, a, a county that, that encountered a hundred and a um, hundred and 13 uh, uh, recovered bodies just in one year, 2013 and uh, 2012. 
And that, that presented a major problem, you know, in terms of the bodies being buried without DNA being taken. So it took us a period of from March of 2013 to 2000 and, uh, August to change that practice in Brooks County uh, in order for bodies to be sent um, uh, approximately two hours away to uh, a, a Webb County that had a, a, a medical examiner. And that in itself uh, proved to be a major um, advocacy win for the center in terms of bodies going to, to, uh, to uh, a medical examiner. So their the DNA can be registered with the proper uh, uh, bodies, uh, the, the proper laboratory in University of North Texas. So uh, in that regards, you know, we have begun the process there of trying to um, uh, um, maintain some protocols in the recovery of, uh, of bodies. Uh, and we have, with the South Texas Human Rights Center, uh, also has a, um, one of the major things that we're known for, of course, is the water stations that we are, are in and around Brooks County. Uh, we have close to 175 water stations that are uh, distributed uh, in various ranches and in back roads, you know, to where people, um, uh, they're accessible to the migrants. Bear in mind, once a migrant gets to the U.S.-Mexico border, that person, that, that migrant, uh, uh, once he crosses the border, he is turned over to um, a guide, a coyote, as we refer to them uh, here in South Texas, and they are then escorted uh, to uh, to the brush, uh, and where the the individuals um, are trying to circumvent the checkpoint. Checkpoints are there's 128 checkpoints all up and down the U.S. Mexico border, where people have to um, uh, get through those checkpoints and prove the uh, and 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 say whether they're U.S. citizens or or establish their, their uh, identity when they get to these checkpoints. The checkpoints are, is a clear um, um, uh, manifestation of militarization on the US and Mexico border. And so that, that is where migrants are trying to circumvent the checkpoint in order to get to the big cities and, and to where they can uh, unite with families or they can also get um, with friends and, and find the essential work that is done in, this, in the United States. So um, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, in 2013, we established the, the protocol for them to be able to send the bodies that were recovered in Brooks County and send them to a medical examiner for, so the DNA can be submitted in the proper uh, uh, laboratories. And then we've also doing the question of uh, trying to save lives uh, with with some of the migrants uh, in state in placing these water stations. Um, the um, the 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 we also have a missing migrants hotline in in South Texas, where we're receiving calls from as an NGO. We receive the calls from. Uh, various people all over South Texas, all over uh, all over South uh, Central America, the three main countries being uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and then from also from Mexico. Uh, people call us and and try to um, you know uh, it says uh, for us to assist them and trying to locate their missing loved one. Uh, prior to the pandemic, prior to COVID-19, uh, uh, we would uh, uh, do a, um, the, and these are established protocols that we did with, with, um, with the um, uh, Border Patrol in terms of sending in a, an inquiry, uh, uh, a digital ties, a computer inquiry, whether somebody had been detained or not detained by Border Patrol. Um, in this respect, it did provide some relief for families because uh, if we found them that they were had been detained and apprehended, then families were were assured that they were uh, safe and lived to be another live for another day. Uh, that that um, is a, a protocols that we established. Uh, you know, category one, 
you know, in terms of determining whether somebody was was detained. And then category two and category three were, were much more intense in trying to re, uh, rescue and recover bodies. Uh, that is, uh, you know, we're probably the only NGO in South Texas in, in the, um, that are on the U.S.-Mexico border that, uh, that entertains, um, that takes these calls in terms of, of, of trying to assist people to investigate where some, one of their loved ones was left behind. And, 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 it's, and it is very, very difficult in terms of the families not having very much information regarding um, once their loved one crosses the border and how they are and when they're left behind whether it's, it's um, um, by uh, the person not knowing the terrain and the South Texas terrain is very, very, very dense, very, um, very thick and brush and vegetation. And right now, and very, very hot in, in terms of the humidity, very intense in terms of people losing, losing and having, not having enough water uh, to maintain their, it can be a uh, a two day or it can be a three day um, effort in terms of walking in the as people refer to it el desierto. It is not really a desert. It is a very thick, um, you know, as I described the terrain, and they're trying to circumvent that and then pick being picked up on the other side after they have circumvented the checkpoint, and. Um, so that's where people are perishing. People are dying in 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 um, in South Texas. You can compare South Texas to to really to the Mediterranean in terms of the number of people that have 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 perished and have not been recovered. So uh, people will will uh, attempt to circumvent the checkpoint. Um, there is one particular uh, method that. Um, by border patrol that causes people to scatter. Uh, if they come upon a group of 10, 15 people, then people are, um, uh, they run everywhere into the brush and, and there is no, uh, there may be an attempt to recover all the bodies, but that's not the case. And that's how people wind up also dying um, in terms of, of um, not, not uh, uh, coming back to the group or, or, or uh, reuniting with the with a guide in terms of being able to make it through the brush, and we're we're basically talking in the in the, um, uh, in that people are trying to make it through at night and in darkness in terms of trying to get through. So uh, we feel all these calls with uh, with um, from people from from the U.S. Uh, people trying to uh, locate their loved ones. Since March of, of this past year, um, the, the, the Trump administration has imposed uh, public law number 42, which does, um, uh, it does not even, um, people are not able to present any asylum case. They are quickly taken back to the, to the bridge and escorted back to the bridge after their name uh, their date of birth and, and fingerprints are taken, and a brief, very brief uh, uh, background check is done. But within the hour, people are being expelled. And uh, since the pandemic in in South uh, in the United States has taken over, um, um, the protocols are that's the protocol. So that's over like two hundred thousand people that have been expelled, and and nobody. Uh, uh, asylum case has, has been entertained to any degree. Nobody has any, um, any possibility of presenting a case uh, to the Border Patrol agents. They're immediately taken back and to the bridge and expelled. Uh, so we have uh, uh, just recently uh, an example in terms of our efforts to do uh, identification purposes and, and repatriation. Um, we have a, a cemetery mapping project that, uh, that we are a part of the Forensic Border Coalition uh, and the Forensic Border Coalition and composed of the Argentine uh, Forensic Anthropological Team, South Texas Human Rights Center, 
the, the FAC Center, um, the Forensic uh, Anthropology Center at Texas State, and the Calibri Center for Human Rights in, in Tucson, Arizona. Um, the, uh, the efforts to do identification and repatriation, um, these protocols have been very, very, um, um, I think that since uh, that the, the center was established in 2013, we have exhumed um, over 220 bodies have been removed from the cemetery in Brooks County. Uh, and of those, um, and then other, off, the other cemeteries that we have been covered where there are unidentified um, uh, burials, uh, we have also um, t taken that project to exhume um, uh, for identification purposes bodies and stored those at Texas State University, their Freeman laboratory that does the, the analysis and the, uh, the, uh, the, the study in terms of determining uh, different uh, aspects of, of those individuals. And then they're submitted their DNA. Uh, Eduardo, I'll just ask you to just wrap it up in a minute and then I can yeah. ask you some of the questions to, for follow-up. Yeah, I'm almost very close to, to miss, uh, finishing. So that effort is undertaken with uh, uh, forensic, the Forensic Border Coalition in terms of, of establishing the protocols that have were non-existent in South Texas in terms of, of uh, identification purposes and trying to uh, establish some repatriation uh, and we have been successful with about over 30, 30 uh, bodies that have been identified and, and identified and repatriated. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, uh, Eduardo Canales. I, I didn't even manage to give uh, an introduction, but I think that, uh, you know, the explanation of the work that you do at the South Texas Human Rights Center is, is self-explanatory. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a wonder that, uh, you know, your key objective is to rescue migrants who are in danger. And I think you have been able to just demonstrate and show us through the different examples that you've given us from identification, provision of um, uh, basic supplies, uh, uh, and as well going a little bit further uh, uh, for, for migrants that are in danger in the, in the, in the area of South Texas. Um, I was uh, looking back at some of the work that you have done in, tw in 2018, and I, I saw a, a very small clip. I think it's a feature of, I mean, what sounds like a small number to what you were doing, but you were explaining, uh, for instance, uh, what was happening in this particular clip is that two bodies of teenagers, because they were 18 and nine years old from, I think, Mexico and El Salvador, who were just found, uh, whose bodies had essentially just frozen to death, um, uh, found crossing the border. And in my, in my mind, I just thought, and you, you mentioned something in that clip where you said, you know, for everybody that's recovered, there's about five bodies that are missing out there. Um, and there are, there's about five bodies out there. And so my question would sort of be, what's really happening and I think you've been able to answer some of this some of these numbers you know to give us some of these numbers uh, even in your in, in your intervention but you know what's really happening around that space um, in terms of this and, and do you do you really see a collaborative effort that's really coming also from these sending countries um, and also the number of children what are the you know when we come to break it down a bit to understand who are these migrants that are making these crossings have you seen with experience over the years if this has moved to include more women Women and children, for instance, and when we're talking about uh, the youth as well. So maybe just to come back a little bit on that one, uh, I give you a minute. Okay, I will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, again, there's uh, no, there's no systemic way to investigate uh, the missing, uh, the people that have perished. Um, uh, we're, you know, one NGO that does does that investigation. So uh, for uh, you know, for every person, for every body that is recovered, you know, that that do go as high as five estimates of people that are still out there, and that's and unless an NGO like uh, the South Texas Human Rights Center and the and uh, students from Texas State University or uh, do um, a particular uh, organize some and get permission in some of these ranches to do line searches. No other effort is undertaken in terms of, of uh, public officials to do uh, a, you know, a, a, a process of searching for bodies out there. Um, 
everything, everybody that that is recovered, every re, um, uh, remain that is uh, um, encountered is it's incidental to the work that exists out there with with uh, some of the ranches doing, you know, doing a uh, during hunting season or doing cattle or, or in that regard. So it's nothing that is that is an official process of trying to uh, re retrieve these uh, bodies that have perished out there in South Texas. Um, and we're, uh, it is uh, very, very, you know, um, when we organize a search in some of these ranches and we get um, um, permission to do that, it is very, very, uh, um, you know, hard to really get, get do the searches in this terrain to try to find skeletal re remain. Last year, in the last two years, there were uh, 50 and 51 re recovered remains and bodies. And usually it winds up being half bodies and full bodies that are of, of, of migrants that uh, perished uh, uh, very recent. And then there are the rest, uh, the other half is uh, skeletal remains of people. So this year we have uh, I think as, as 30 is the number of recovered bodies and skeletal remains in Brooks County. And what I'm only talking about one county, which is 75 miles from the border. And that is where it has a major, major uh, checkpoint that people try to circumvent. And they go through private properties and private ranches. And that is different. That is what is very different from Arizona in terms of Arizona uh, that border being uh, public uh, um, Bureau of Land Management, um, public lands. And, and, but it's still, it's difficult because that's a very, very mountainous and very rough terrain. And then this, this area over here is very, very thick vegetation and, and it's as difficult for people to get lost and perish. Thank you, um, Eduardo, for, uh, for those insights. And I think it's also, you know, um, interesting to hear of the differences that, you know, migrants would face. Uh, and then I guess also the challenges that come with trying to save lives in these different types of terrain, uh, because that goes uh, not just for the migrants, but also for the ones that are trying to do rescue uh, and in terms of also recovering bodies. So the kind of challenges that you go through. Um, if I just g give a very short, you know, for, for those who didn't know, uh, Eduardo Canales is the executive director and founder of the South Texas Human Rights Center, which is based in Texas. Uh, and uh, among, among many other things, he's, you know, organized a lot of movements, but also been a, a community and labor activists um, since the 70s. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, he's also currently the board chair of the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Um, and he, like I say, co-founded the South Texas Human Rights Center. So we're very privileged that he could share his insights uh, with us. Uh, I will come back to you, Eduardo, in a bit. Maybe